Okay, we're looking at chapter 16 here, conquering a continent, 1854-1890, so mostly the post-Civil War era, what, what happens to the, the land itself. We talked about reconstruction mostly in the south. This is about coming west now, okay? And this, and this idea of conquering a continent, uh, what, what does that mean? Stole, uh, here's a, here's a, uh, a book that was written uh, by Ronald Wright, Stolen Continents, 500 Years of Conquest and Resistance in the Americas. So we don't always hear about the resistance part, but there was resistance. The, the people that were here, their, their way of life was changed when the white Europeans came. Uh, a counter history that challenges all of our comfortable assumptions. So it wasn't quite the westward ho uh, movement that we all talked that we, we all learned about. That, that this this great thing, okay? That there was there was greatness in it for sure, but there was also some some cruelty and some uh, despair for, for people. Okay. So post Civil War, the country's shaken still, depressed from the war. You know, the, the, the build up to that war took took up half the half the first the first half of the nineteenth century. Uh, you know, trying to build a nation after the war, trying to rebuild it, trying to enter the Industrial Revolution. This is in full swing in Europe, but the Industrial Revolution and you know mechanization and, and what people would call progress took a back seat to the Civil War conflict between North and South for the first half of the nineteenth century. So, so the question, now the war's over, did the country rid itself of sectional strife at the culmination of the war? You know, the South's in reconstruction mode, and we talked about how that didn't work out very well. The newly freed slaves were still living lives of helpless servitude and being intimidated and, and scared of, uh, you know, away from uh, utilizing their, their vote, which was their right as a citizen, okay? So... But the country itself, you know, looks at, okay, who are we now? We're, we're, we're back together. We're, we're a whole union again. What's our next move? So they set their sights on acquiring more land. Remember the Mexican-American War, the manufactured war. They, you know, America wants to expand, and America's look, look to the West. Uh, so there's kind of a feeling of a new beginning, a fresh start. Uh, you know, many white men in the South, white men, had been dispossessed by the war, lost everything. African Americans trying to find their place in an, in an oppressive South and an unwelcoming North. Native Americans clinging desperately to the hope that the, the tide would turn for them. They developed what was called the ghost dance. We'll talk more about this later. A uh, very popular dance. And this was, this was an influence partly by Christianity, partly by Natives or, or Native ways, I should say. So this was a dance uh, that was designed to bring back the bison, the buffalo herds that, that had, been, had been wiped out, and to drive the white man back to the east and across the Atlantic where they came from. So you have these people, you know, as this war ends, you know, what, what direction do they have? What about women? White women had lost their opportunity to gain the vote with the 15th Amendment when they decided it was just going to be for men. So women continue to live lives that were shaped by the actions of their husbands, okay? So you have some despair, but inside the despair was hope. And people began to look to the West in expansion. You know, the war was over. The centuries-long struggle is settled. Let's move on, okay? So let's do this. Uh, let's watch our first film here. And so... Go ahead and pause this and, and watch the film entitled Westward, Westward Expansion Crash Course, U.S. History Number 24, okay? Go ahead and watch that. Okay, so America's Progress, very famous painting by John Gast, 1872. Uh, this is the idea of manifest destiny. And we've mentioned this before, but to just refresh your memory, God had chosen the white Christian people as the ones to spread across the land and make it their own to bring a Christian society organized by white supremacy. Well, at least according to the white Europeans, okay? Non-whites would be converted and fit in the best they could. Uh, of course, they would have no real opportunity to advance, okay? So the Native Americans are an issue as you come west. What do we do? What, what, what's to do? What should we do with them, okay? Uh, so this, this painting kind of says a lot here. You, you see the angel, and she is symbolic of progress, okay? And you can't see it too well. This image is somewhat uh, a little bit blurry, but she's got a, a telegraph wire in her hand, 
and it's kind of dangling behind her. She's got books in her, in her, in her other arm. So this is progress, right? Education, communication. You look to the, to the right of the, uh, of the image to the east, I suppose. And you see at the top there rivers with, you know, with, with ships on it, you know, commerce, right? Business, a teeming city. You have the railroad, you have the, the Pony Express, you have the stagecoach, you have settlers, people moving west, okay? So behind the angel, it's bright because she's enlightened everybody there and turned them into America. Looking to the left or the west, you see it's dark. And, and who's running? The, the old ways, right? The, the buffalo and the bison, the natives, they're running from progress because it's not going to include them, right? Uh Okay, so so in the East, <clears throat> by this time, uh, post-Civil War, the Native Americans had been subdued or removed, okay? And, and there, wasn't, there wasn't any threat, uh, you know, by them by that time, okay? But what about the West? They were still there. And in many cases, hadn't even seen white Europeans yet, okay? Uh, but 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 they they see them coming and they're not they're not accommodating to the idea because clearly these people don't 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 have our best interests in mind okay uh, and of course it always angered the natives about these masses of people that come trampling across their sacred lands and tearing it all up we talked about you know leveling forests for for cities to plant. Strip mining, tearing apart, you know, mountains to get gold out of it, silver, uh, uh, overfishing, so you'd have you have none left. Okay, pollution, all, all these things came pretty quickly after the Europeans came. Okay, that they didn't have that problem before. The natives didn't treat the land that way. Okay, so you have this dilemma: what do we do with the natives in the West? Uh, okay. Uh, and you, you, so, so you have this issue. You, you've got uh, also a completely different point of view about the land. You know, the, the European saw it as private property, fences, barbed wire. Natives had no concept of private property. Okay, so, so you have you have this kind of conflict between these two two people that are very very different. Okay, so so how do you go about getting rid of the Native Americans in the West? The United States government sent in sharpshooters to travel the prairie and kill all the buffalo. This is an actual picture of a huge mound of uh, buffalo skulls. Okay, these are skulls of dead buffalo found on the prairie. Why were they dead? Because the government sent in hundreds of buffalo hunters and told them to, to just shoot indiscriminately, kill them all, don't worry about the meat and the hoofs and the fur and the whatever, like the native would do, just kill them and drop them where you see them go to the next one, okay? Just take out as many as you can. So in a, in a very short period of time, the buffalo across the prairie were, were, were nearly extinct, okay? Uh, and this is a pretty amazing picture. Ted tells a huge story. Uh, so so why, would they, why would the government do this? Why would they send hunters in to do this? to take away the natives' food source, not just their food source, but their sacred way of life, hunting the buffalo, uh, killing a buffalo, and then using the buffalo meat and skin and everything else was, was part of their life. It was sacred to them. If you take the buffalo away, they don't have any food source and their way of life falls apart. Okay, so the, the Native Americans are very quickly shaken at the atrocities of the white man, okay? This is a, uh, a poem that kind of puts this all in perspective, perhaps. It, this is called, In a Past That Is Now Lost Forever. There was a time when the land was sacred, and the ancient ones were as one with it, a time when only the children of the Great Spirit were here to light their fires in these places with no boundaries, when the forests were as thick as, as the fur of a winter bear, when a warrior could walk from horizon to horizon on the backs of the buffalo. When the deserts were in bloom, the streams pure as freshly fallen snow. In that time, when there were only simple ways, I saw with my heart the conflicts to come. And whether it was to be for good or bad, what was certain was that there would be change. So that kind of says a lot. Let's just kind of go over it real quick here. There was a time the land was sacred, and the ancient ones were as one with it. 
a time when all of the children of the great spirit were here. So what's he, what, what, what are they saying here? There, there were no white people here. It was, it was native people and it was sacred. Okay. And they had their ancient ways. Okay. Uh, to light their fires in these places with no boundaries, no barbed wire fences or, or any other kind of fence. I mean, it was open, open land for everybody. When the forests were as thick as the fur of a winter bear, not, not, not torn down and chopped down for, uh, to plant or for a city, okay? When a warrior could walk from horizon to horizon on the backs of the buffalo. Well, you saw the, the image before with the buffalo skulls. Not anymore. They were gone. Uh, when the deserts were in bloom and the streams pure as freshly fallen snow, not polluted, okay? Uh, pollution, and this was, you know, a huge problem that they'd never dealt with before. In that time, when there were only simple ways, I saw with my heart, the conflicts and change would come pretty pretty clearly, okay? So this is kind of a, you know, a kind of an, an overview of the Native American's dilemma, okay? This is a pretty famous painting called The Coming of the White Man. And symbolically, what, what, what is this image telling us? You, maybe you can't see it very well in this image, but there's a ship out there on the horizon coming to shore. And the Native Americans see it and they're, and they're oh my gosh, they're, they're, you know, fearful. They're hiding their heads. They're they're hiding their faces. Who? What is this? So, pretty clearly, you know, it changes for them, right? I mean, they uh, the, the the change that com that, that comes from the coming of the white man is is, is pretty obvious, okay? Uh, and uh, symbolically, that ship out out there would be Columbus, the first the first ones, okay? So, so, so you have these these issues, okay? That this 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 go this this started for them way way back, and these people come, and you know they're supposed to be benevolent Christians ordained by God, yet they're slaughtering buffalo indiscriminately. They're 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 you know pushing natives out of their land. They're they're removing them, you know, without any, with without any kind of uh, you know discussion. Just it's time for you to go, and we'll talk about these things. Uh, so understand, um, Native Americans, the history of, of Native Americans in the lands that are now the United States is very vital to the story, needs to be known, understood, fully grasped the history of the United States, not the candy-coated one, the real one. So their story is a very important part of American history, okay? Okay, so back to our uh, our westward expansion and one, one of the huge uh, events of that era is the transcontinental railroad now there you see there it kind of starts in the middle of the country there were already railroads to that point from the east but now you now you have one that goes all the way across to the west okay so a uh, huge undertaking uh, but once it was completed it, it was it, it allowed people to cross the entire continent in just days instead of months okay Okay, let's let's go ahead and watch our first. Uh, I'm sorry, our second film here, uh, Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, it says one of five. You're just watching one, so go ahead and watch that film, and when you then come back. Okay, so did did you happen to catch the line at the beginning of the film? Uh, we 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 finished the job that Christopher Columbus started. So what do they mean by that? What did the what the, what did this Transcontinental Railroad ultimately do? that people have been trying to do for literally centuries. Finally, it allowed for easy access to Asia for trade, okay? If you're living in the East Coast, even though it's the 1800s, post-Civil War, you still want those goods from Asia, and they're so far away, how do you get them cheap? Well, well now you've got a railroad that will go from the West Coast to the East Coast, and of course, from Asia, to, it's a simple you know, ship across the Pacific, and there you go. Long journey, no question, but cheaper and 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 available. Okay. Uh, so this elusive Northwest Passage to the Exotic Orient was now a reality, and goods could be shipped across the Pacific and then transported by rail to the East. Okay. Okay. So uh, so subduing Asia became foremost on the minds of the American government. Now, post Civil War. The Mexican session lands are complete. The United States is is complete in the in the shape it's in today. Okay, so what does Manifest Destiny stop now? You 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 completed your goal and we stop? No, it continues and it continues to this day. Okay, 
subduing Asia became foremost on the minds of the American government. They, they felt they needed to open relations with the Far East. Uh, but Japan, one of the people they were interested in having relations with, did not want to have open relations. They were isolationists. They were they they just kind of did things on their own. Okay, uh, so they they don't they're not interested in, in dealing with the United States. So the United States comes comes to their harbor with a with a uh, show of force. Okay, with ships, mil military intimidation, ships in the harbor. Uh, kind of forcing Japan uh, to to sign this treaty. So what is this treaty about? America wants to have places to to re refuel. Okay, so so why why would that be important? To to be a world power, you have to have you have to have access to the world, right? Uh, steamships in those days required coal, so you need to have what in my day would have been called filling stations, gas stations, places to stop to get more fuel, filling stations worldwide, places to resupply, fuel, repair, give your men a break, okay? Uh, so in this case, you're talking about expansion through trade, not conquest, okay? Interesting. Okay, who is William Seward? Uh, William Seward had been the Secretary of State for both Lincoln and Johnson. So Secretary of State during the Civil War for Lincoln. And this was a, uh, a man that encouraged trade and, and encouraged America to build bases in Asia and the Caribbean, okay? Uh, he wanted to annex Hawaii. Why would you want to do that? Because Hawaii is right in the middle of that ocean and a nice place to stop and resupply. It's a place to take a break, right? Uh, perfect stop. Uh, okay, so how did how did America annex Hawaii? How did it, how did Hawaii become an American ter territory that would ultimately become a state? Okay, let's go ahead and watch our our third film here. Uh, Lilio Kalani, Hawaii's La last queen, is the name of the film. So please watch that. Okay, and then come back. Okay. Okay, so a story that not many people know. You know, it wasn't pretty how the United States uh, uh, acquired Hawaii, okay? Uh, they did it somewhat by force. Took the, 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 the Marines took the queen out, ousted her. Okay, another, another uh, uh, important event is the Panama Canal. Now, this is, this is a huge thing. Uh, of course, it wouldn't be complete until 1914, many years after our era, but right before World War I. But this idea, if you look at this at this image, if you're going to ship from New York to San Francisco, this is this is before the railroad. You have to go all the way around South America. It's 20, I'm sorry, 13,000 miles. Okay, it's a long, long way. What's what's your other choice by by stagecoach or wagon train across the, the nation, that took probably longer in those days. So the idea of the Panama Canal, you cut this canal through the very narrow part of Central America around what today is Panama, and you cut this uh, this journey almost in, in two thirds, or I should say one third of, of the old way, 5,200 miles instead of 13,000, okay? So Seward is pushing for that. Uh, Seward also also uh, purchased Alaska, and this became known as Seward's Folly. You know what? What do you want that for? It's frozen up there. There's nothing there. Who can live there? It's too it's too cold. Uh, this this would become one of one of the uh, uh, a huge bargain down the road. Initially, he was scorned for it, but it turned out to be. Uh, you know, a a huge plus for America, just just resources alone, timber and minerals and gold and fish and all, just kind of an endless supply of resources. Okay. Uh, okay. One of your terms, the Berlin Game Treaty. What what was that? Secured rights for American missionaries in China. Uh, remember, they're always converting. Okay. Secured rights for missionaries in China also allowed for migration for Chinese workers for the Transcontinental Railroad, okay? So I, I said migration. We hear these words over and over, migration, immigration, or emigration. So what's, what's the difference? Migration, a change in residence that's intended to be permanent. So you migrate to a new place. 
when you emigrate, you leave someplace. And when you immigrate, you enter a country. So you, you can make the argument that you could do all three, right? You're, 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 you're moving someplace new, you're leaving your country, and you're entering a country. But that's, that's what those mean, okay? So when you hear migration, emigration, or immigration, they're, they're slightly different, okay? Okay, mentioned after, after the Transcontinental Railroad was finished, you were talking about, about the Chinese here a minute ago, and there seemed no further need for them, okay? They were no longer allowed to come to America. They, they were um, the Chinese Exclusion Act that we'll talk about down the road here. But, but this is part of that era where suddenly a, a pretty valuable uh, labor source that had been used in the, in the railroad and the gold rush, you didn't need them anymore, and you cut off their immigration. You can't come here anymore, okay? Okay, but rail, but the railroad and railroads in general changed everything. It changed, you could transport troops, supplies, goods, people anywhere in a short time. Kind of kind of created the idea of the modern corporation, which is huge today. Uh, you know, the United States originally was built on small business, but really is a dying breed even today. Corporate America has driven the small the small business person out of business in many cases. And it kind of starts here, okay? This is where, you know, big corporations start. Uh, railroads were private enterprises funded and subsidized by the government, but but very much open for schemes and fraudulent activities, corruption. Uh, chapter 15, one of your terms was the was the credit mobilie, and and that was the uh, that was the the scandal about during Grant's presidency presidency about about people you know getting land for for uh, very cheap, okay? So soon, the railroads linked all points of the United States, okay? Another issue is tariffs. So what, what is a tariff? Tax or duty that the government charges on goods coming into or going out of their country. And what this is trying to do is protect the American businessman. You know, American-made cloth costs $4 a roll. So, you, so you've got $4 coming from, from England, but the dollar tariff is added to make it the same as the Americans. So, uh, I'm sorry, one dollar more. So, so the Ameri American-made goods are, you know, are cheaper. Okay. Uh, so this is also to try to not allow low-wage foreign competition. But what, what's what's the result of that? Americans did not have access to cheap foreign goods. If you can buy a a, a cloth blanket for three dollars. You know, shouldn't you be able to, or four? Shouldn't you be able to? Uh, okay, but the uh, okay, where'd I go here? Okay, but but uh, this helped to transform tariffs and 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 such helped to transform American corporations and the U.S. economy into a huge success. But the benefits weren't felt by the workers. This is a this is an ongoing theme that is through all of human history. The people that are in charge want to keep all the money and not pay the workers very much at all. They pay them as little as possible, and don't give them any kind of, you know, um, any kind of any kind of success or, or, or hope because you want to keep the keep the uh, the the costs down. Okay, do we have that issue today? We, yeah, we do. Sweatshops. What what's that? The, these are in this country too, but mostly these are considered to be in other countries. This is where this is where people come to work for very, very low wages. They're they're in a huge room, low ventilation, low no heat in the winter, too hot in the summer. Uh, you know, the American corporations are looking to, to reduce their bottom line, okay? Me meaning that they want to cut costs. So you're looking at Minimum wage here is going to be fifteen dollars an hour pretty soon. When well, you can go to a foreign country and pay somebody four, five, six dollars a day for the same labor, it costs a lot less, right? So, who shops at Walmart? I'm assuming everybody does. Why are their clothes so cheap? Because they're using foreign labor that's much cheaper than it, than it is here. So they they don't they don't have to charge so much for their for their goods. Okay. Uh, they farm out their labor to foreign countries where they pay extremely low wages to people in poverty. Okay. Okay. So, so you have this kind of, kind of this setting. Okay. Um, workers and, and, you know, people, 
people of color, uh, Native Americans, African Americans still trying to figure out their places. Uh, this is a quote from your book. In the Southwest as well, the federal courts promote federal courts promoted economic development at the expense of racial justice. This is the Southwest, not the Southeast. Okay, we talked about the Mexican American War. And the Mexicans that had been living there were forced off their former lands. Discrimination in Mexicans uh, happens. Uh, and forced off their lands justify the name of economic gain, left thousands homeless. Uh, at this same time, mining became a huge industry in, in America, uh, to, but also tore up the land. You know, the, the United States went to the gold standard back in its currency with gold reserves. So you look at these guys, you know, tunneling under under the earth, and, and that looks pretty claustrophobic to me. There at the bottom, uh, dragging a uh, dragging a little wagon behind you, and a little little tiny uh, uh, corridor. Wow, I, I couldn't do that. Anyway, but anyway, but 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 miners are are iconic, right? This is this is an American, like a cowboy, uh, and you have these huge uh, uh, strikes. Uh, the Comstock Lode, in Nevada, huge silver strike. Uh, so, so most of the successful mines, the big mines, had engineers and modern technology and operate on a huge scale. Uh, but, but there were some, some miners like, like this person here, you know, single miner, kind of like I said, iconic fi figures of the West, like the cowboy. Uh, and and other, other, uh, other resources boom also because of mining, timber and lumber. Markets benefited from this. So Seattle, Portland, the great Northwest grow because all these mines need, need lumber to shore up their tunnels, right? So they don't collapse. Uh, the, the, the Great Plains that had been populated by natives and, and buffalo for centuries, now, now cattlemen pour in. You know, natives are gone. Cattlemen pour in. Transform the land very quickly. This, this land went from being the way it had been for centuries to by the 1920s, it was, it was completely destroyed in the Great Dust Bowl that we'll get to towards the end of our class. Okay, So the cattle drive, long drives, one of your terms. What, what is that? Uh, how, how many Hollywood movies have been made about cattle drives? I mean, literally hundreds, okay? Very romantic idea of the cowboys out in the ranch pushing their cattle along. What were they doing? Well, they're, they're driving their cattle north from Texas to the Transcontinental Railroad. Why, why is that important? It used to be you'd have to slaughter your cattle in Texas or wherever you were deep down, deep in the south, and then ship the meat to the east, and much of it would go bad because you, you, there's, you know, it's, it's too far. It would go bad. Now you can, you can drive your cattle to the train, put them on the train alive, ship them to Chicago where all the, where all the slaughterhouses were, and they could be slaughtered in Chicago. Then, of course, refrigerated cars come along in the railroad, and you put the meat on in a refrigerated car, it gets to New York or wherever the East Coast, and it's fresh, okay? So, so the West is exploding, and the, and the government passes the Homestead Act, uh, would give 160 acres, that's a huge parcel of land, to, to people for free, if you just simply go there, make a make a stake, claim, make a claim. If you stay and improve the land, if you if you did this for if you kept there for five years and improved it, it would be your land for free. So this creates a stampede of people, free land, right? And they came by the droves and populated the land. Now now these lands on the survey maps of where to go to make your stake were labeled as empty, although there were thousands of people living already living there. So so the Europeans took on Columbus's kind of point of view. We're discovering here, although there's lots of people here, same thing. Uh, discovering something that people are living on or, or staking a claim, you know, in places that, you know, people were already there. Uh, did the West offer opportunity for, for African Americans? Um, well, you have the exodusters uh, fled the South, uh, Left to Kansas, try, getting trying to get a get a, away from the racial oppression that they were experiencing in the South. We talked about that in the chapter fifteen, the the reinstitution of white supremacy. Okay, so many many blacks immigrated from Mississippi, Louisiana to Kansas, 
you know, to, 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 to try to get some opportunity. Some went to Texas to work in the expanding cotton industry. Of course, a job they knew very well from when they were slaves, okay? Women were in a huge part of this Western movement, integral family units move west. Women are there to manage the family and, and, and be part of that journey, whatever they had to do, uh, taking care of their kids. So the work of women and children were, was integral to, this, to their success. And interesting, uh, well, uh, Mormon women were involved in plural marriages, polygamy, where you'd have a, you know, a, a man that might have five or six or more wives. OK, one of these women was was one, one of these women was named Emmeline Wells. OK, and she organized the movement that pressured the Utah Territory to allow women to vote in also in, in Wyoming. And this is this is many years before the uh, 19th Amendment, but so Utah and Wyoming actually allowed women to vote way before the 19th Amendment made it a federal law. Okay, um, but the abuse of the land uh, is something that can't be denied. The environmental impact quickly, very quickly happened. Uh, overuse, abuse. Uh, it turned out that the, that these free 160 acres were way too much to maintain without water, uh, but but the European settlers were defiant. It was kind of part of their part of their personality and charm. They felt they could conquer nature to get the land subdued and the wild nature out of it. We're going to conquer nature and make it our own and be successful. But they they destroyed the land. They overplowed it. This created an avenue for weeds and destructive insects, also erosion, okay? John Wesley Powell was a uh, Civil War veteran who lost a leg in the war. Uh, he explored the Colorado River, and he claimed that the large parcels of land, the 160 acres, would, would not work in the southwest, that you needed water. And he suggested to the government that you... You create irrigation projects like the Mormons were doing in Utah, but the government voted them down. So you have all this, all this water, uh, I'm sorry, land, but you don't have any water. And this creates problems because, you, because the land can't prosper and grow without water, okay? Okay, um, so, this, so this kind of, uh, you know, abuse of the environment creates a little bit of a movement. And, and, and thoughts so that perhaps we should put some aside before we destroy it all, okay? So the national parks become a, a thing here. Yellowstone Park, the first national park. Uh, also, so the national parks are developed. The U.S. Fisheries Commission was developed, okay? Which is nice, but it's nice to put land aside. But, but the Native Americans are bewildered. You know, the, the white man destroys the land for all their projects, mostly to make money, but then put aside a park so people could remember what unused lands look like, right? It used to all look like that, according to the natives, and you came in and destroyed it. You create a commission uh, to halt the extinction of fish, um, but, I mean, the reason why there's no fish is because the Europeans overfish. You know, a, a native would go to a, a lake or stream and catch two or three fish to feed his family. A European would come and catch 500 so he could feed his family and, and sell the rest. Okay, so different points of view, okay? Uh, kind, kind of brings to mind a, a song from the 70s. And this is a pretty popular song that you, you may recognize the lyrics. Uh, Joni Mitchell was a, uh, well, still, I mean, she's very old today, but but she's still alive. But she was a very famous 60s songwriter and kind of a, you know, the uh, uh, anti-society kind of kind of uh, you know what was happening in the 60s. Young young people tearing their backs on the on the government and so on. Anti-war. It's a very influential. She wrote this song called "Big Yellow Taxi," and the most famous line in, in it in the song is, "You paved paradise and put up a parking lot." This was also redone by the Counting Crows in 2002. Let's just look at a little bit of these lyrics. Don't it always seem to go that you don't know what you've got till it's gone? They paved paradise and put up a parking lot. They took all the trees and put them in a tree museum, and they charged all the people a dollar and a half to see them. Hey, farmer, farmer, put away that DDT now. Give me spots on my apples, but leave me the birds and the bees, please. 
So this is kind of what the natives were saying. This is exactly their point of view. You paved paradise and put up a parking lot. You took all the beautiful trees and you put them in, in a museum. That's how they saw Yellowstone. Not, not that there's anything wrong with Yellowstone, but, but it was all like that. Okay, and then, now you charge people money to come to the park to see what, what open land used to look like. Hey, farmer, farmer, put away that DDT now. Now, DDT in the 60s and 70s is a very, a very poisonous, toxic um, pesticide that was spread in all fruit. This is where you come up with organic fruit today. Because if you took a, if you bit an apple that was sprayed with DDT, you didn't wash it. It can make you very sick. Uh, back in, the, even in my time, you know, when you, when you buy fruit, there were spots on them. They weren't perfect. Today, it's all different. You know, it's all about perfect fruit and, and, you know, uh, they've been modified you know uh to 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 uh not not go bad you know so early so in, in the name of progress but sometimes people you wonder right this is how the native americans felt about the europeans that came west embarrassed and hurt by how they approached the land okay okay um chief J chief joseph joseph sorry of the nez Perce tribe this is a quote from him, from your book. Americans were not settling an empty West. They were unsettling it by taking it from the native peoples that were already there. Okay. Uh, so, so, so far, is anyone surprised by what they've learned here? Is this, is this different than what you thought? You do, do, are, are we standing anti-American? Again, not intended to be. Uh, and as instructors, we have this challenge, you know, teaching what really happened because it's not always pretty versus the sanitized version, the, 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 the rose colored candy coated version, right? I'm just going to make the, make the point. I'll make it from now and then America's proven to be a great country, regardless of what anyone says, including me, that's a given, but truth is what creates change. And we are in need of change in this country today, right? Uh, of course we are. We always will be. That's the beauty of a free country. You, you, when you have a free country, there's going to always be different points of view, and there's going to always be people pushing for change. That's that's the point. That's the beauty of it, okay? Okay. Uh, let's do – I don't know what happened to my uh, my title page here. Let's do supplemental lecture number two here, and we'll call this the Clash of Cultures, Clash of Two Cultures, Okay. So supplemental lecture number two. So we know about how we how we do this now, right? This is one of eight before your midterm, okay? Okay, so um, so we talked a little bit about the Native Americans, and this westward expansion really is the story of their final demise as a free people and a player of consequence in American history. It's a clash of two very different cultures. Uh, and it seemed impossible for the two to come together and compromise due to their vast differences, okay? Remember I said the French integrated with the Indians better than the English did? Uh, you know, it, it would be interesting to see what would have happened if the French had won the French and Indian War and how they would have dealt with the expansion. It would have been different, but the English despised the, the natives from the very beginning. The first occurrence of biological warfare in American history took place in the French and Indian War, when the English offered Native Americans a gift of blankets. Of course, they were surprised but it, and, and distrustful. You know, why would they do give us blankets? They, they hate us. Well, it turns out the blankets were, were infected with smallpox and many of the natives died. So, so the point of this lecture, the clash of two cultures, is, is, is why was it so violent? Why couldn't they come to a compromise? Why, why did the Europeans commit genocide in these people? Um, why didn't they try to integrate them? Okay, and the point I'm trying to make is is it is because they're very two very different people with very different wants that came into conflict with each other. Okay, and I'm gonna I'm gonna make a main point here that that I'll I'll talk about by the at the end. Okay, okay. So going back to the Great Plains, that that's kind of your iconic, you know, uh, stereotypical idea when you think of the Great Plains. That's what you think of: open land. Very no mountains, just hills, and buffalo, right? Uh, okay, so uh, so originally, when the when the Europeans subdued the East, the revolution and all that, and and uh, it was done, they decided that the Native Americans could could have all the land 
west of the Mississippi. Okay, uh, that that was that was the first idea. Um, but ultimately, the economic opportunities that the West, you know, provided proved too much for the American government to stay away from, and they broke their promise again. Okay, uh, so the idea was developed to assimilate them by Americanizing them. Okay. Uh, this idea of 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 uh, you know taking the taking the natives and and telling them to lose their ways, their language, their religion, and become like Europeans. Okay, uh, just 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 for fun, let's look at a picture of the Great Plains today, like the 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 reality of the Great Plains. Okay, that's what it looks like. If you fly across the country in an airplane, you look out over the Great Plains. It's not it's not a big open empty space it's cut up into all these little checkerboards this is these are farms these are farms that originally were started by white Europeans okay um, and I'm don't misunderstand me guys the, the the Great Plains feeds the world you know a, a huge amount of food is grown there so you certainly can't say it's a bad thing okay you're talking about huge amounts of food the, the, but the point I'm trying to make is just how the land changed. You know, this it was, was not the way it was before the Europeans came, okay? Uh, okay, so back to this idea of Americanizing them. Um, so, so reformers called for new policies that would destroy Native people's traditional life way. This is off your, off your page 525 in your book. Uh, destroy Native people's traditional life ways and civilize them, as one reformer put it. And here's a pretty a pretty interesting quote: "Kill the Indian and save the man." So take take a native man, take the Indian out of him, and fill him full of the West or or, or Americanize. Okay. So what is this an example of ethnocentrism? So you have these two cultures. One culture is very laid back. The, the natives let the world come to them. They responded to it. They they respected the land. They didn't tear it up. Getting ahead. And getting riches was not in their vocabulary. They 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 moved slow with the land, uh, but the but the Americans come, and they have this you know achieve 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 succeed succeed succeed, you know uh, projects to make money and 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 you know tame the land as they called it. Okay, now most of these Americans had come from the eastern United States, uh, some were from the Northeast. Where, where there was still a strong Puritan work ethic that had developed there. In the 300 years that they had been present, the Puritans, they, they developed this, what's called a, the Protestant or Puritan work ethic, okay? And that, that had become, in the past, the measure of the Puritan man, okay? So this is a very important aspect of this, of this supplemental lecture. You have to have this point in there to get full points, okay? So what I'm trying to tell you here is why these two were different. The Native Americans, I already said, they they were they uh, they uh, uh, lived on the land peacefully. They didn't tear it up. They they didn't see this this idea of business and property. They they were they were kind of had simple lives. Okay, the the Americans came in with this with this whole different point of view of opportunity and tear it up and make money. Okay. Uh, Push, push, push. You, you have the situation today where you know Americans don't take vacations; they just work, 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 work. It's always to achieve and, and get ahead, make more money. It's kind of how America is. So the point I'm trying to make here is where that idea come from, and 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 why is that seemingly so built into Americans, specifically white Europeans? Okay. Uh, and this is where we where we bring up this gentleman named Max Weber. Okay, this is this is his point of view. He wrote a book called The Protestant Work Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. Okay. So understand, he did not create this Protestant work ethic. He's just simply making an argument about it. Okay. It wasn't something that he created. Uh, so what is this what is this idea of this Protestant work ethic? If you go back to the Puritans. They were very harsh. Their, their religion was very harsh, very male dominated. And they had this, they, they believed in this idea called predestination. Uh, and what, what's that? That means that God had a plan for all people. And a certain group of them, which he called the elect, were predestined to reside in heaven after their life was completed. 
but the point was that God already chose who they were before they were born. So no one knew whether you were a member of the elect or not. You could simply speculate, okay? Am I one of the elect? Oh my gosh, what if I'm not? I won't go to heaven. This was very, very important to them, okay? So people began to believe that if they pursued a virtuous life that included hard work, honesty, frugality, asceticism, which is the avoidance of indulgence, uh, simpleness, piety, they could increase their chances of being included, included as one of God's chosen people who would live for eternity with God in heaven, okay? So according to Weber, the doctrine of predestination was, was the dogmatic background of the Puritan morality in the sense of method, methodically rationalized ethical conduct. Wow, really, that's a mouthful. Okay, working hard and becoming successful in business became a popular vehicle for these Puritans to, in their mind, gain the favor of God. This would increase their chances of joining the elect but also would give the impression to one's community that they were predestined and would, and would be saved by God, okay? Again, a, a quote from, from Weber. The old Puritan doctrine that works are not the cause, but only the means of knowing one state of grace, and even this only when performed solely for the glory of God. Righteous conduct alone did not suffice. The feeling of grace was necessary in addition. He, God himself, described works as a condition of grace. So works meaning meaning hard work, uh, business, commerce, whatever it might be. So this ideal became very important, and hard work became a definitive of the Puritan community and became ingrained in the people. Uh, this this principle became a standard of Puritan life: work, work, work. Don't stop. No breaks. Don't enjoy work, work, work for the glory of God to prove to God that you're worthy to to be a member of the elect. Uh, so this was used, this idea was used as, as an example to encourage, encourage others to work hard in their lives as a method to please God. Okay. So this, this Puritan point of view, this, this Puritan work ethic, Protestant work ethic, both the same thing, this permeated into, into everyday American life and hard work with tenacity became part of the American character. Uh, and the result is this idea of the Protestant work ethic. And according to Weber, it was embedded in people of all stations. So this helps explain why the Americans were driven so hard to gain and excel. It was ingrained in their culture. So, so, so 300 years, 200 years later, the American settlers coming west, they, did, they weren't necessarily Puritans anymore. It wasn't about religion anymore. It started back with the Puritans. But the idea of work hard, work hard, always achieve – spread to everybody, any any American. This becomes very much a, a part of this new American, you know, uh, personality, okay, is work hard, okay? Uh, so, you, so, so this kind of explains who the Europeans were. So I already mentioned who the natives were. So you have these two very different cultures with very different goals that come together. And when the white people saw the Indians, they saw them as lazy and un uncommitted to growth, uncommitted to progress. Uh, you know, again, Americans were motivated by profit and making money, okay? This was accomplished by working hard to please God. So the whole point here is this is the opposite of the Native ways. They didn't have anything in common. They had no common ground to come, to come together for a compromise, okay? So, so, so the point I'm trying to make in this lecture is these two people, okay, these two different types of people, one, one established and been there for centuries and had a way of life that worked for them. Uh, they weren't unsuccessful. They weren't savage. They weren't, they weren't inferior. They just were different. And then these Europeans come with this, with this different attitude about expansion and growth and success and business. And, 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 you know, no one can get in our way. That's, that's very much a part of, of this lecture, but, but the key to it, the relevance of it is it, it's, 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 this idea that Max Weber states that it was the Protestant work ethic that was ingrained in Americans that made them that way, that, that made the Americans that way. Okay, this this fear of not being accepted in heaven by God. Now, like I said, the people in the 1800s maybe weren't thinking that way anymore, but going way back to the Puritans in the 1600s, that, that work hard ethic 
permeates into everybody even today. You don't have to be a Puritan to feel it. It's kind of ingrained in who we are, okay? Okay, so it's very important to put Max Weber in and his and his theory into this answers. Many many people write the whole thing about this about this this lecture and don't mention him. Please mention him. It's it's he's a huge part of the story. Max Weber smelled like what spelled spelled not smelled spelled like Weber W E B R. Okay. Okay, so that's the end of that supplemental lecture, and it's it's also the end of our lecture for the first part okay so go ahead and go to the next the next part and we will uh, wrap up this chapter okay thank you